tour of Zoom and how our event is going to work tonight. Uh, you'll notice that all of our participants, all of our atten lovely attendees have been muted, but that doesn't mean that you can't communicate with us. On the bottom of your screen, uh, you will see a few options. There's a raise your hand option, a chat option, and a QA. and a uh, Everybody who sees that raise your hand, go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, yes. Brilliant. You got it. Perfect. Um, chat is a way to send a message to the presenters and or to everyone else in the webinar. So when you open your chat, your chat box and your window, you'll see that you have an option in a little drop down menu to choose either to send the message just to the panelists or to the panelists and everyone. Um, so keep that in mind as you are preparing your chat and we ask that you use the talk to everyone option sparingly. Uh, the other tool that you'll see is the Q&A box. This is where you can type in questions for Jen, Meg, and Lisa. The second half of our evening is going to be a time for questions and answers, but you can type your question in that box anytime. For example, Jordana Lindsay Birch has already asked in the Q&A box where Flash is. Oh, well, I uh, put him in the other room because of his propensity to find squeaky toys uh, whenever we are having a Zoom conference or webinar. It's his special party trick. So speaking of that, please uh, take a moment to locate the exit closest to you, which hopefully you already have a sense of. Yep. And go ahead and unwrap any candy or text really at any time during the, the conversation. Tonight. Or, or maybe grab a giant bowl of the crunchiest popcorn you've ever made. Or you could make yourself a cappuccino with all the <laughs> and the whirring uh, right in the middle of the conversation. Oh, and speaking of drinks, a small spoiler alert, there's gonna be a toast at the end. So if you want to go ahead and prep yourself a beverage to have at the ready uh, and maybe grab your phone so you can take a toast selfie and then you can send it to me at jess at nnpn.org and I will be so very delighted. Um, that would just be great. Basically, make yourselves comfortable and we will get started in a few minutes. And thank you so much for being here with us this evening. I'm Nan Barnett. I'm the executive director of National New Play Network. We here at NNPN are delighted that you're with us for our very first ever event to benefit the network and its programs. As you probably know, uh, NNPN is an alliance of professional not-for-profit theaters uh, that collaborate in innovative ways to develop, produce, and extend the life of new plays. These theaters now more than 125 of them all across the country need your support now more than ever. And by joining us tonight, you're helping new play theaters and theater makers making new work during this time. We wanted to uh, share with you uh, tonight a little about, a little peek behind the scenes about one of the great projects that we're supporting when our theaters reopen, and that is Jennifer Blackmer's Predictor. The play slated to receive an NNPN Rolling World premiere, which is what happens when three or more NNPN member theaters decide to mount the same brand new, previously unseen play within 12 months of the opening night of that first production. NNPN provides support to these theaters so that they can work together and have the playwright with them during the rehearsals and performances, learning from each director, designer, cast, and audience as the work moves across the country. Predictor, which you'll get to know a little more about tonight, is scheduled to have at least four Rolling World premiere productions in the next year, including at NNPN member theaters Capitol Stage in Sacramento, Phoenix Theater in Indianapolis, and Boca Raton's Florida, Boca Raton, Florida's Theater Lab. Tonight you'll have the chance to hear from the creator of the play about how it came to be and to meet the amazing woman whose story inspired this work. Here's NNPN ambassador and New Works director, Lisa Rothi, to tell you more. Hello. 
Hi, hi, my name is Lisa Rothy, and um, I'm so happy to be here with everyone tonight. Um, I'm a director, yes, I'm a big fan of NNPN. I like the word ambassador. Uh, and I've been the director of New Works at Kansas City Repertory Theater for the past year. And we're grateful that you could all join us virtually this evening. I'm just gonna start out by giving you a little bit of context for our conversation, and then I'll give you brief bios for the, our illustrious guests this evening. So um, this conversation is going to be with Jennifer Blackmer and with Meg Crane. And Me Jen wrote a play called Predictor, which chronicles the unknown but true story of Margaret Crane and how she came to design and invent the first home pregnancy test. Based on Jen's exhaustive research, interviews with Ms. Crane, and loosely inspired by a New York Times article that I'm gonna let Jen and Meg tell you about, the play deals with the unbelievable story of Margaret Crane and her unlikely but pivotal role in developing the world's first home pregnancy test. Uh, Meg Crane, or Margaret Crane, Meg Crane, is a graphic designer and illustrator. Beginning in 1969, she worked with her late partner, Ira Sturtevant for over 40 years doing advertising and marketing for pharmaceutical, financial, and cultural organizations. She designed graphics for the IBM Gallery, AT&T Special Projects, Japan Society, Scientific American Magazine, and a number of small hotels on very small islands. She designed and illustrated Insanity Clause, published by Simon & Schuster, and illustrated Two Swallows in No Time by Marcia Shinas. Meg is the inventor of the first home pregnancy test in 1967, for which she holds two patents. Her prototype of the test was acquired by the Smithsonian Museum. Now for Jen, Jennifer Blackmer's plays have been produced off Broadway and across the country and include Human Terrain, Unraveled, Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace, in which she received a jo Jefferson, Joseph Jefferson Award for Best Adaptation, Delicate Particle, Particle Logic, Borrowed Babies, and Predictor. Jen was the recipient of the 2015 Penn Laura Pell's International Foundation for the Theater Award for Emerging American Playwright, and her screenplay for Human Terrain won the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Award through the Tribeca Film Institute. Jen is a two-time O'Neill finalist. Her writing has been shortlisted for the Princess Grace Award and the Shakespeare Sister Fellowship, and she's been developed by Seven Devils, Illinois Shakespeare Festival, Nash Nashville Repertory Theater, the Playwright Center, The Lark, and Activate Ms. Midwest. She serves as a professor of theater and director of the Virginia B. Ball Center for Creative Inquiry at Ball State. So I would like to introduce Jennifer Blackmer and Meg Crane. Hi. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Welcome. <laughs> How we're all like in our different little, our little homes. I know. Separate little yeah. windows. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for joining us tonight, both of you. It's great to be here. I'm very excited and very, it's weird, but great. I feel like I'm sort of at mission control, I guess. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start out, I'm just gonna dive right in and we're just gonna kind of go to the, the a little bit of the nugget here. Jen, I'd love to hear from you about how you found Meg's story and how you decided to write a play about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember, it's, it's funny because um, there's the, the play is sort of thematically centers around this idea of, of a moment when something hits you or you get inspired by something or you get an idea. And I, 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 I love to talk about that in terms of the, the visit from your muse when it happens, it happens when you least expect it. And, you know, I was working on a bunch of projects and I, uh, my plays center around um, feisty female protagonists who don't often do what people expect them to do. And I love stories like that. And I was sitting on our back porch a couple of years ago and I was reading the paper and I was eating breakfast and I will never forget that moment. It was a gorgeous morning and I saw a headline and I was scrolling through and it said, should women be trusted with their own pregnancy tests? And I was like, yeah, we should. And then I, I started reading the article because I knew it was probably make me mad, which, you know, the place can be found in, <laughs> in places that make you mad. Mm -hmm. I read it and it was the story of Meg and I was just, I was, I was entranced by what she did and how she did it and how in particular the historical record was wrong. And that was essentially 
the story of this article as well, because it was written by the a writer to sort of cre- correct the record. And, um, you know, Meg can, can tell you a little bit about that as well. But um, I have a collaborator and a, a dear friend of mine that I've been working with now for 12 years, who is out there somewhere in cyberland, um, <laughs> Brian Minskin. Uh, and I sent him an email immediately after I read it, I opened my computer and I said, so what do you think of this? Do you think this should be a play? Actually, he, he likes to say, my first question to him was, do you think it should be a musical? <laughs> <laughs> he, he emailed me back about 20 minutes later and said, uh, do I think it's a musical? No. Do I think it's a play? Yes. And um, Brian has this extraordinary way of, of getting things done and finding the right people to talk to in order to get permission. And he said, are you interested? And I was like, sure. And then I went about my life and was working on these other projects, as I said, and I don't know, it was probably about a month later, uh, he called me and I was actually in Los Angeles taking a, a bunch of meetings at the time. And he said, so what are you doing Friday? And I said, I don't know. What am I doing Friday? He said, well, you're having a conference call with me and Meg Crane. And I'm like, what? (laughs) And and the rest is history. So we we met that day and the three of us were on the phone and we probably talked for about an hour. And Meg is is amazing. And so (laughs) she said she was interested in exploring this idea with me. And if I'm not mistaken, Meg, I think um, you were interested in particular that it was a play, right? That you had actually heard from people who were interested in doing films and that kind of thing, that we were the first people to approach you about a play. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you have friends in the theater and, and all of that. So why, why a play? <laughs> why did a play appeal to you? Because I liked speaking with you, number one. It was really fun. And I liked your, your approach. Everything it was just so nice. It really was. And um, I had about, you know, three or four, maybe more film offers, that sort of thing. And I just didn't really want to jump into that. But when you came in with this, I thought, well, yeah, I like it. Very nice. Um, it was a good conversation. And that sort of got me going. So Yeah. And <laughs> you, you kind of know, you know, when, when, when you meet people and, and you kind of click with them. So we spoke a lot and it was um, Brian and Meg and myself on the phone and we talked a few times and then we did some more I think formal interviews and then I sent uh, Meg a few emails because I was interested in seeing what her voice was like on the page like if she were to write an answer to me versus actually you know speaking it so we, we emailed back and forth and I just collected a bunch of stories and Meg has the most amazing life. And so <laughs> there was a, just this, this rich, rich pile of, of material to, to think about. And um, then after that, we began, I began crafting the play and I sort of went into uh, what Margaret Atwood calls her writing burrow and kind of you know disappeared for a little bit and came out with a draft and we got to do some some very closed uh, development processes and readings and and you know getting a lot of the kinks worked out and structure and that kind of thing, and then we shared it with Meg and that was probably the most terrifying three days of my life because <laughs> we, <laughs> she wanted to read the script and we're like sure okay here you go and send her the script. I was terrified. I was terrified. <laughs> well, what what Meg when you received that script. Well, I'm curious, actually, about what your thoughts were after you got past the, the terrifying part. <laughs> what were your thoughts about <laughs> you know, hearing we, about your we, story? Yeah, we, we've spoken so much back and forth about it that um, I think um, I had a fair idea, you know, what was going to be. I hadn't really known how, how Jen would handle this. I, I just love the way she did it. Lots of humor through, which I think is really great. That's really nice. And um, um, it all went pretty well after that. I think we just went back and forth a few times. Um, not too much in the way of changes, I don't think so. Um, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, you didn't see the early messy bits. Yeah. No, <laughs> <I guess not. laughs> uh, uh, one of my, my favorite things to tell my students, and I, I guess, you know, I don't know if we have any kids, maybe it's rated R, I don't know, but the shitty first draft that Anne Lamott likes to talk about, you know, that was, <laughs> you don't share that with anybody. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I was reading the play, which is a it's a 
this is a beautiful story. It's, it, it, it's true. It does have a lot of humor in it, which is, and it has a wonderful tone. So I, it's, it's interesting because this is slightly out of context because people, uh, the audience, probably the majority of the audience hasn't read the play. But I'm wondering just in terms of context, I was reading, when I was reading about it, reading about that moment when Meg, you read the article in the New York Times about who made that home pregnancy test, mm -hmm. right? And I'm wondering if you can tell us about that moment. So for those of you who aren't, haven't read the play, you'll get just a little sneak peek into that. I'm just curious about your, ex your experience. Well, that, that was a, a um, um, that happened one Saturday morning, two years back. I, I took in the Times, had my coffee first and opened the magazine section. I usually go to the puzzle first and the, the recipes <laughs> after that or something, right? But um, there was um, this article that by Kagan and Kennedy, who's a wonderful writer, she was doing a series of, of inventions and inventors, that sort of thing. And, um, and so there was that title, Who Made That? The Home Pregnancy Test. It wasn't the first, just the home pregnancy test. And it was about the present test. It's a wand, you know, format. And, um, and uh, about this wonderful design, it really is a very beautiful design. But I thought, my God, you know, I did the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was really didn't know where to go with this, but I, I wrote to the Times right away. Nobody got back to me. And so I, my, um, my family um, also read this and said, you've got to do something about this. And um, my brother Peter got in touch with the Smithsonian. I didn't know he did right away. And, and uh, his daughter, uh, Maggie's a journalist, and they all got onto this and, and got me to bring forward something about it. So, um, um, and then Pagan wrote a wonderful article. That's the one that Jen's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, about uh, she she really followed up so beautifully. I'm very grateful for that. Um, sometime after. Um, yeah. Great. Thank and it you. was the story. It was the story of of that that kind of that that there's a pivotal scene in the play at the end of Act One. Uh, the thing that struck me so much is that Meg she crashed a meeting of people pitching prototypes, and that was so unbelievably brave. I mean, she wasn't given permission to do this. She just walked in. She you know put hers in line with everybody else's, and that was one of the many things that struck me about the story. And I think uh, Peg and Kennedy did a, a great job in in sort of you know transporting you into that world of 1967. So it was a great place to start. Um, I'm wondering, is this a, uh, I'm actually wondering, Meg, about where that idea came from for you, the initial idea. Well, and is I, that I, something, yeah, let's yeah, just add. I, I, I was a um, uh, freelance uh, graphic designer for this pharmaceutical company, and they were planning to go into the uh, cosmetic business, which they had no right to do, really. They were a business to business. <laughs> <laughs> it was not their, it's not their stuff uh, at any rate. I was working on some of their, their ideas for that. And uh, one day I had to go into the laboratory, which is a different building than where I was. And um, uh, I saw a row of, of um, uh, test tubes and I asked somebody what these were. And a um, uh, man in the lab said, well, those are pregnancy tests. And um, he explained that when you know, a woman goes to the doctor and leaves a sample of urine, um, they go to this company. They did that 50% of these tests. And uh, I saw that and it just like, I don't know how to explain this. It's just like, you know, lightning or something. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, all this would take is a little test tube and a mirror and a woman could do that herself. And from then on, I was like um, obsessed with this. That's, that's what it became. So you, in the play, your character has an epiphany. And there's a section, and, and Jen uses a chorus, I think, really beautifully to bring in all different characters and different voices. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a section where the chorus says, there's a moment where everything changes, a moment when you're one thing before and quite a different thing after, a moment when what was once a neutral exercise becomes personal and profound. And I'm wondering for both of you, actually, about um, Meg, that epiphany or that moment, and for you, Jen, that text and the exploration of that moment. It certainly was for me. I mean, that was, um, I, I can't even explain how um, it just became <clears throat> an extraordinary um, find. I don't know how to explain that. And I went back to my, my um, uh, New York uh, apartment, told my roommate 
about this, and, and um, I, I think you probably didn't understand exactly what I was saying. Why would she? You know, women couldn't do that. And um, um, I, I just had to do it. That's all. It's it carried me through the next few years, I'd say. That's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I began thinking about that. I mean, it was this, kind of the same thing that happened to me when I read the story. You know, it was a situation of I had this experience reading the story and thinking about this this uh, this woman who, at that point, I hadn't met. And the story needs to be known. I mean, it, it needs to be known, and we don't often give ourselves the space to to listen to that part of ourselves, to to the intuition and to those. Um, those those things that occur to us that may be completely out of the the blue because they're not a typical response to something right and and i i tell my students a lot that we we need to let ourselves be bored and we need to let ourselves just just kind of look and be in the moment and ask ourselves what might be very simple questions uh, or perhaps maybe even ridiculous questions in those moments. It's like what Meg said, um, you know, why can't a woman do this herself? I mean, all it would take is a test tube and a mirror. Why can't she do it herself? Mm -hmm. And yet the, the confines of the world at the time and the structures of the world at the time were so anti that, right? And, and just, I think, to have the courage to listen to a thing and that that voice and to pay it heed and say you know what let's let's take this further let's go down this road and and let's play with this and see what we can do and I think you know storytellers experience that as well and one of the the repeating themes in my work um, over and over again is I love telling stories about science and I, I also love the parallels in science and art because I think our best scientists also sort of approach the world in that playful questioning place right and asking themselves what if or you know why does it have to be that way and then they go about pursuing truth in the laboratory and artists do the same thing and so the fact that meg uh is an artist a graphic designer but she found herself in this very scientific space i thought was absolutely phenomenal because that is a way that the two of them are similar right so that's another thing i think when, when you get those moments of inspiration how you go about exploring those and what is your process and i think the artist in meg really was able to reveal something that the world needed at that time right no, so i, I no. go ahead i have to say about that on the science end of it i am not that and and i did not i did not invent the pregnancy test um, there was a woman named Judith Kaito Haidas who was working at NIH for a number of years, about the same time, the late 60s, to, to uh, improve the reading of the woman's the hormone of pregnancy. And um, she actually finished that work in 1972. And I found out about her after the fact. And so the test that we started out in with Canada wasn't even the perfected, you know, reading of the test, although it was very mm. good. But I want, she did all this work. Every test that's out there is because of Judith by the Kaidas, who um, I found only a few years ago. She died a couple years ago of Parkinson's. So, um, um, but, but that's the science end of it. I could never have done that myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think sort of taking the structure of that science though and and looking at it from a, a different angle which is essentially mm -hmm. what you did i mean you you told me in one of our interviews meg that it really was a design problem right mm -hmm. that you weren't necessarily changing the test as much as you were trying to figure out yeah. how to make it appeal and and to a wider audience and understandable by a layperson yeah and so that's again one work. of the brilliance yeah. Yeah, and, and to make it work because that was the other part of it. It had to work, and um, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the development of this story along the way, I'm just thinking about the collaboration or the conversation or Jen, how you did some of your research and you know where you came in to theatricalize what it, the story and also um, Meg's relationship to you and in terms of the, you know, being able to feed you some of the some of the information and some of the research. I'm just curious about your collaboration. 
people always tell me that that the play is 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 very funny and and <laughs> there's this sense of joy to it right that mm -hmm. that it, in fact it's a it's a very difficult story because you know meg was pretty much by herself in this world that was very much structured by men and very much about a particular way of doing things and she just didn't fit in that way and um every conversation that i had with meg whether it was in email or in person was just so joyful and i always <laughs> laughed and it was just this the just the uh, meg your outlook on life is just so extraordinary and so that was really what became critical to me as i crafted the play is i really wanted to honor that voice and her outlook and her joy and my own joy mm -hmm. with being able to now have this friendship in my life, which is mm -hmm. amazing. And um, um, so, so that is from a, I guess, from a stylistic standpoint, that was kind of how it evolved, right? I kept kind of thinking over these, these stories that she would share with me and the surprises that we'd have and the laughter and all of that. And I really kind of wanted to infuse the play with that without um, w without pulling away from the seriousness of what happened and the fact that this was in fact a world changing thing that she made and the fact that women are still not given agency over their own bodies. And so that becomes, um, that becomes the, the the sort of key driver, I think, in, in me trying to figure out what the voice of the play was. And I also wanted it to pull in a lot of these different stories that Meg had shared with me, almost like a um, almost like a quilt in a way, like you are, um, you know, pulling in a story from your past and a story from your childhood. And oh, this happened, but this it told me about this particular moment. And there's a, a very short scene where. Uh, young Meg is talking to a nun who gives her a 98% in algebra, but she wasn't even enrolled in the class. <laughs> I just, I was like, oh my God, that has to be in there. And everybody who read early drafts of the play will tell you that there were just way more things than I could put in the play, <laughs> right? So that became very important to me as, as I was working. And um, also, I think what happened was there's, to me, at least, there's a sense of the ridiculous in the the sense that women are still fighting for agency over their own bodies. And when I began thinking about what that was like in 1967 and sort of imagining what some of those scenes might have been or what some of those moments actually might have been in 1967, you look at it through the lens of present day and you're like, oh my God, that's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. That is so ridiculous. But yet, you know, it's really only a hop, skip and a jump to where we are now. And so there was also, I was able to find a lot of joy in the historical lens of the play. So it takes place in 1967, but it's a uh, it's what we think 1967 might have been through a, a kind of a pop culture-y kind of lens. Mm. And, and that gives us permission, I think, to laugh at some of these things. Mm -hmm. But then also, as you get to the end of the experience with the play, consider the importance and the magnitude of why it's still a problem and why it was a problem then. Yeah, it was a problem then because a lot of people thought this should never, ever be. We got a lot of flack and trouble from the company because of that. Mm -hmm. you know, women shouldn't be doctors are supposed to do that mostly male mm -hmm. doctors of course at that time and um uh people thought it was immoral I and mean, really had a lot of trouble with with um, the morality issue and all that sort of thing because of course this is before the abortion laws changed in the early 70s this is still 67 and it's um uh, all the social uh, mores of changes going on in the 60s and and um um, you know, a lot of free sex, which isn't really free, right? So um, um, there, it was a different time. It was quite an mm -hmm. in, interesting time. Um, and so to read the play and have your experience, I'm just wondering too, this is we're gonna, the last little question I have before we're gonna take a little break. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Meg, just about uh, your experience of seeing yourself and your story portrayed in a theatrical form. 
<laughs> it's hard to explain. It's really pretty wild. <laughs> it's really, it is pretty wild. Yeah. Meg got to Meg got to see a reading that we did at the Phoenix earlier uh, this this last In year. Indianapolis. This, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, over the summer, and um, uh, Brian was there as well, and he sent me a picture that was my screensaver for a while, and it's Meg mm -hmm. in the audience sitting there watching Lauren Brigham who was playing Meg and he put this little caption on it and it says Meg watching Meg. <laughs> like, oh my god. You have to ask him for that. <laughs> yeah. I have it. I'll send it to you. <laughs> That's great. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break. I think, I believe either Nan, I think Nan or Jordana is going to come back. Yes, Nan. And Nan. Hi, talk Nan. to us for a minute. And while we're doing that, if we could have um, any of our guests who are watching us this evening who have questions for Jen and or Meg, please think about those and send those along. And after we come back from our break with Nan, we'll go into some of the audience questions. Thank you. I think we're going offline here. A little sip. <laughs> Nan is muted. Nan, hang on one second. We're gonna unmute. I gotcha, I'm done. Go. All right, Great. ladies, take a little break and uh, I'll talk for a minute and we'll be right back. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. I, I'm just delighted that NNPN can share this wonderful conversation with you and that we have this opportunity to be able to remind you about the amazing and impactful and important theater that's being made all around the country. Um, this isn't, of course, how we had hoped to be together tonight. As many of you know, we were in the midst of planning our annual New York City benefit when the COVID-19 pandemic made it clear that coming together in person was um, no longer a safe option. But we're thrilled that we've been given the opportunity to share this evening with you and to tell you more about NNPN and how its work impacts the American theater. We were looking we're looking forward to joining you again when our theaters open once we're past this but doing everything we can to make sure that our 125 member theaters will be ready to serve their audiences as soon as they can and that our more than 300 affiliated artists find homes for the work that they're making now during this time we hope you'll donate tonight to national new play network to support our programs rolling world premieres like this one for Predictor that's coming up, and the new Play Exchange, where you can find Jennifer's wonderful script if you haven't read it yet. Um, I'll tell you more in a little while about how you can read this play or any of the other, as of 7 p.m. Eastern tonight, 32,417 plays by living writers that you can find there. Your gift will also support NNPN's travel and collaboration funds, which enable our companies and their artists to work together to develop, produce, and extend the life of our new plays and our commissions, residencies, fellowships, and workshops that help playmakers grow their skills sets and increase their networks while creating and uh, supporting these new works. Your donation will help the network provide support for our companies as they reopen, guaranteeing that these theaters and artists, those living and making theater in small towns, in mid-sized cities, and in the country's major art centers, that all have access to each other so that they can share their informational or physical resources during this time. Additionally, your gift will ensure that NNPN can provide theaters from Juno to Miami with assistance and expertise and art that will help these organizations rebound, rebuild, and strengthen their connections to their communities. Please join us by donating tonight a gift of any size, $25, $225,000 will have an important impact. We want to say a giant thanks to those of you who have already given. Your acknowledgement, along with a special gift from NNPN, is on the way. And if you haven't given yet, now's a great time to join and show your support for new works. You can find the link at the bottom of the information you received earlier today, if you'd like to donate, 
or you can do it via our website at nnpn.org. That's nnpn.org. Just click on support at the top of the homepage to show us how much new work and the theaters and artists that make it mean to you. And now we are ready to return and answer some of those questions. Lisa, are you there? I'm back. There we go. Hi, Hi. Meg and Jen. Come back in. Hi. I know we have some great questions for you. And I'm sure there's a few more to be loaded. Remember, guys, you can uh, put your questions in by typing them into the Q&A, uh, hitting the Q&A button and typing them in there. Ready? Great. Yes. We're waiting for Meg. Oh, to where come did back. she go? There you go. Hopefully she's hey, there. She is. Hi, hey. Meg. No Hi. Way. I didn't disappear. <laughs> you get some All right, wine? I'm going to get out of the way. Yes. You guys answer yes. some questions. They got to get, get prepared for the toast later. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, Meg, this might be a friend of yours who asks a question. Um, Arthur Cover. Oh, yes. 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 Arthur says, and because he says something personal about you, he says, you've always been one of the quietest people. Where did the steel come from to assert yourself? In that moment, you became a new woman. <laughs> oh. He's quite right about that. I was pretty shy, but I think um, I think I was so uh, obsessed with this. It just happened because it had to do it. I, I don't know how to explain this anymore. I just thought this had to be, and uh, it took what it you know. I just had to go forward with that. Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, something too. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't exactly remember the text uh, what it was, but it was something that you had to do. But it was also. Um, the way you in which you grew up too, and there was something also about a Catholic upbringing, which I think I identified with, and also like things that you're supposed to say, <laughs> and things that you can't, you know, things that you cannot say. And I think in in at that time also, you know, what a woman is a, should or should not say, you know, or what are supposed to be kept quiet. And so I'm yeah, just interested yeah. in that. As as a child, I could not say the word pregnant because that was a bad right. word. Right, you just can't do that. Um, remember Lucy and, and um, um, uh, the video about Lucy and Desi that she couldn't say pregnant on screen? That was right. back in the 50s, I guess, right? Um, right, there were some other words for it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. En salt. En salt. En salt. En salt. En French. Right, thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or expecting, expecting was another one. Yes. Yes. Right, expecting right, right. and so. but that was like shocking to say. <gasps> oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Come yeah. on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We had to get very it creative. A, it was an actual term. Like it was a, like a thing that was happening to the woman's body, and that was not to be discussed. Come on. So we have a question here, Meg. Did this design feel like a profoundly political act? especially at the time? And did you feel part of the revolution for women's rights and autonomy? Yes, um, it, it really did feel very political, very political, because I knew it was going to be trouble, number one. Um, you did. Um, yes. You did know this? Yes. <laughs> but you had <laughs> yes. to do it anyway. Well, yeah, you yeah, know, of course. Not, yeah, that was it. Why shouldn't women have this, right? Why not? Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we've got, we actually have a, quite a few questions here, so that's good. Um, Let's see, Timothy Scholl is asking uh, for Jen. Uh, oops, does the question show up? The other ones disappear. Okay, for Jen, um, he says, I don't know that there's a real question here, but perhaps you can speak to this. So many of your plays beautifully capture these moments where a woman identifies and wrestles with the profound. They are these emotional moments that repel sentimentality and re reveal strength and depth in your characters. It is unusual and it makes your characters distinct. Where do these moments come from and how do you identify these moments in the story? Wow. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> Ken knows Jen's um, work. Yeah. Uh, I have, um, I, I've always been really uh, surprised at how theater from when I was, you know, from when I was a little kid, theater was, was it for me. I mean, it, it moved me in ways that, that nothing else did in terms of, of storytelling and yet as I began looking for stories about women wrestling with the profound there just weren't 
any when I was in you know high school and college and studying theater and it it became clear to me that a lot of the the revered female roles in the history of theater at that time were all you know they were caretakers and nurturers and they were you know behind the scenes and they were jocasta and they were you know the the people who caused the problem a lot of times and the people who would um, soothe the protagonist as he was wrestling with the problem. And I was like, so does that mean women don't wrestle with the profound and the divine and ask huge questions and try and, you know, shift the world and all of that. And I knew that that was sort of what I personally wanted to try and do. And so it became, you know, I guess a, a goal for me to try and create characters that are uniquely female so in other words it's not like just a woman you know trying to play Oedipus or Hamlet which is you know its own definite project but coming at things from a female lens and looking at the world through female eyes and still trying to ask the huge fundamental and profound questions and what would that look like And so that's kind of what I I try and and find are, you know, women who don't, stories about women who don't fit into the mold necessarily and and what that might be. And in doing so, I've been kind of guided by what I myself might try and do in that situation or knowing powerful, amazing, wonderful women, what they might do in this situation. And that's one of the reasons why Meg's story was just so immediately meaningful to me, right? If she had a similar background to me and she mm-hmm. was raised a particular way. And, you know, my, my mother, um, I, I spent a lot of my life trying to unravel this thing my mother told me when I was like 13 years old, which is, Jennifer, I'm not a feminist, but I'm raising you to be one. <laughs> and I don't know what that meant. And I'm, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and I'm still trying to figure out what that meant. But I I think, you know, now that I'm on this side, I've got a a little bit more of a handle on that. But it's complicated, and it's a paradox, Mm -hmm. and it's difficult. And so I spend a lot of time wrestling with that. So I'm glad that comes through in the play. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that I was struck by when I was reading the play and reading some of those scenarios that you were in, Meg, I was really struck by um, some of the language, some of the scenarios, some of the situations. And I thought, oh, I've been in those. I've been in those situations. Mm -hmm and even fairly recently. And which actually brings us to a question uh, Kirsten has, which is, Jenna, are you, or, and both of you, are you surprised by how timeless the story really is, considering the challenges women still face in the workforce and being taken seriously by male peers in particular? Meg, you wanna go for that first? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, um, has it changed? Do you think it's any different now? Are you seeing anything else? Um, <sighs> Since since the nineteen sixty seven, sadly, I think the details of the problems that we're dealing with are different. But I think the problems themselves are the same. I think the context is different, but the problems are still the same, right? In that we're still trying to function in a world where we didn't make the rules, and you know what what do we do? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that the Me Too uh, and Time's Up um, mm-hmm. movement have done and stuff is just kind of create a container, a container kind of look at something that's always yeah. been there, the systemic, right. but it's suddenly like, oh, oh, we're all looking at it. Yeah. And it just kind of switched and we're all looking at it through this, a different lens. Yeah. We, we yeah. know it's been there. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's, I, I had a, an experience with a reading not too long ago um, where the the women in the audience for the reading who were of a certain age, like, you know, my age and older, were so sort of struck by the moments in the play that they could identify with and things that happened to them when they were in their 20s and, and 30s and, and you know, trying to make it in the world. And one of them asked the question in the talkback about, well, does it feel the same way for younger women? And there was a group of women in the back of the audience who were in their 20s, and one of them literally stood up and said, yes, it's the same. <laughs> and there was this kind of lovely moment it, within the, the audience of this, this uh, older woman and younger woman sort of commiserating about some of their own experiences. So yeah, I, I, it's not surprising to me. It's sad, but you know, I, I think that that's also why we do theater. We try and, and hit those, those, those things about life that are troubling yeah. and 
throw a light on them. Um, you know, I, I really feel that I was very lucky in having to um, be in that, that laboratory and seeing those those tests. And, and the second lucky, I think, was finding the little plastic box that worked so well for it unexpectedly. Yeah. And then the our site paper clip that, holder. Uh, our walking into the uh, conference room that day, which is like, you know, lucky number three, number absolutely. So, um, um, yeah, it all ended up pretty well for me. I'm very, um, um, very lucky, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Meg, there's actually a question about that moment. Um, Tony is asking, given that you portray yourself as a shy person, what was the impetus for you to break into that key meeting and speak for yourself to put forward the test? And how did it feel and how was it received? Oh, it happened because um, when the company decided they would do the product, they would go into the market with this, they thought. Um, they hired some professional um, product designers to do some, some work on it. And I didn't know about that. I heard about it. And um, so I went into the uh, conference room, bringing mine along, waiting for everybody to assemble. So I put mine on the table after these other guys. <laughs> and uh, guys, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and and uh, I love them, but this is not time for them to be doing something like this. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so in walked Iris Spirit event because they hired an advertising agency to do this. And uh, when I saw him, I just, I, this is hard to explain, but I really fell in love with him immediately. We hadn't met before. And uh, he walked down the table and he picked mine up after all the others. He said, well, this is what we're using, isn't it? And they said, oh no, that's just something Meg did for talking purposes. That's all. Oh, it was horrible. And, um, and besides, we couldn't do that anyway. It's gonna cost too much money. So. Um, I took off a couple of days in work and went to plastic companies and until I found a company that could not, not, they didn't know what it was for, just the outside box and um, found a company who would do it for much less than the um, professional guys. So they had to do it. That's how it happened. And, um, but um, yeah, that's how I got to that, that meeting. <laughs> and you, you mentioned just at the very beginning of this, you said you can't quite explain it, but you said you, you fell in love with him. Yes, I saw her. I, I can't even explain. Yes, he walked in the yes. door and I thought, so love at oh first God. sight. At first sight, I went home to my roommate and I said, I met the man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And she said that at his funeral. She said, I already told me this at the funeral. Oh. Iris, so it was really. Uh, and that was how many years later? Oh, 41 years we were together. Yeah. Um, That's amazing. So the yeah, real yeah. synergistic moment that you all had there at the end of the table with your. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With your predictor, it was fun. Then I had to work with this this wonderful man on pregnancy tests and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Six months later, we were living together, so that worked pretty well. Um, yeah. And were you able to call it pregnancy <laughs> tests by that time, or did you have to call it the <laughs> the all <laughs> test? The all <laughs> test. Well, it was definitely pregnancy test. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they didn't have a problem with it. It was everybody else. <laughs> So this is a question from Jean who asks, how were minds changed about making such a test broadly available to women? And how did you approach that problem? Meg. Oh, for me? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, well, um, you know, Ira and I were, were finally invited. I didn't get paid for this, but we finally get paid because they hired us to, to uh, we're now working together, um, to do the uh, introduction in Canada for a test market. And um, um, the interesting part of that was getting the, the um, some feedback and advertising from people, you know, getting this test. And, and if I answer your question right, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm explaining this, but um, um, Canada was very interesting because it's a very different kind of country from us. And, and to do advertising there, you can't just go across the country at that time with one, one network, for instance. You had to go across all the... Um, provinces and work it out. It was a little difficult, but um, at any rate, uh, we got letters back from, from women saying how wonderful this was, and we did ads saying um, every woman has a right to know, and that was our, our theme, mm -hmm. and um, of course, we got a lot of horror letters from uh, ministers and people like that who got up in church and said that this is an evil thing, and no, 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 this is like um, hard to believe today, but they did, and um, wow. It was an interesting time for us, believe me. Um, 
And there was a there was a quite a gap. I mean, in between the time that you designed it and the time that it actually made it out into the market. Yes, yes. it took ten years, exactly ten years. Yeah, because the company decided they really shouldn't be in the over the counter market anyway. So license they licensed it to three other companies, and, and that's how it happened. Um, yeah, we were out of it at that point. I don't know. Right. Right. Um, and was there anything you wanted to add to that, Jen? I, no, I think that that um, it's uh, so interesting to me that we, again, sort of going back to that initial article, that we look at this thing that is is just a common occurrence almost. You know, I have three kids myself, and it I didn't think about when I was taking the pregnancy test what went into mm -hmm. developing that thing that I was using at the time. And, and literally like looking at this thing and my life changing. So mm -hmm. that is also another, um, uh, I guess, metaphor for that moment, right? Where before you look at the test, you're one thing, and then you look at the test and, oh my God, now I'm something else. So I'm going from <laughs> being not a mother to a mother. And uh, it, it, so it's, it's just amazing to me, the machinations and the, the deals and the politics and the conversations and the, the just the assumptions that go into the the creation and the marketing of that thing. So you can have this mm -hmm. beautiful idea that then gets just just corrupted along the way with all the stuff, all the baggage that comes along with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's another thing about the story in particular that struck me was just Meg's persistence through the whole thing and just saying, you know, this has to happen. It has to happen. It has to happen. And um, one of those situations where you just do what it takes to make it happen. Mm -hmm. so this is a good segue for our next question that Larissa has, which is, uh, were there times in the writing of the play when fictionalizing something felt like a better way to tell the story than depicting it exactly as it was? And that's part A and part B. How did you negotiate telling the story in a way strongest for today with being faithful to the history? Yeah, that's that's probably one of the trickiest things when you're when you're dealing with an actual story is you want to make sure you are um, honoring the story and then also telling it in a way that is immediate for for people in the audience, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's not just a history lesson that it is in fact theater. Um, and I, I think you know Meg being familiar with theater at, at the beginning of this whole process was really helpful, and in telling some of her stories to me, she created pseudonyms for some of the characters that were, some of the characters that were in the play. So Jack and Martin and some of these, these guys. And then she, I would ask her specific questions about these people. And, and it, it was almost like she had this innate sense of what I was trying to find, which were some of the, the sort of strange, contradictory, defining characteristics of who these people are. And that allowed me to be fictional, right? Mm -hmm. But still do it in a way that I was, uh, that hopefully is, is really exploring what Meg was going through at that particular time, right? So it's, it, my, my goal for the play was not to focus on just one moment, but to tell a, a more of a, of a sweeping story from moments in Meg's childhood that then perhaps taught her about certain things and the reason to do certain things in a particular way. And so it does span, you know, several years in this sort of compact way. But I was also having fun with the theatricality of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the the idea of using a chorus um, and, and being very obvious about the fact that this is a story. So I'm not trying to tell this in a realistic way necessarily, but doing it in a way that you can see actors taking on certain roles and doing certain things within a moment and understanding that, okay, well, it didn't really happen this way, mm -hmm. but right. I think we're trying to kind of honor what the decision and the struggle was in the moment. So that was how I did that. And I think from a craft point of view, that was a, a lot of fun for me. And it was also a real learning experience for me because I've never really written anything like this before. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this is a, a little bit part of this question. I'm just going to say it and see if there's anything else that you can mine from this. Andrew Kramer says, Jen, you know how much I love this play and this woman. Hello again, brilliant Meg. Um, can you talk from a craft standpoint about how you wrote 
about a real life history. So this is similar. Mm -hmm. And how do you find freedom in the narrative while still considering and honoring the facts and truth of the reality? Yeah, and, and if, if you look at the play, there are uh, things in it that are obviously um, sort of sort of pastiche or fun with the, the kind of the, the pop culture of the 60s. And as an example, um, there was, you know, Meg talked about the moment when she saw Ira for the first time. And of course, we know Ira is a significant part of the story. And I was, was sort of wrestling with how to do that. And it kind of dawned on me as I was thinking about the emotional discoveries that were happening at the time and what might be a thing in the world that would allow us to kind of go into that space, but do it in a way that we know was not realism. And so in the second act of the play, there's the social health film that kind of goes off the rails. And so it's a way for us to look at the sort of beautiful moment of this love at first sight. She's met the man of her dreams, but then all the baggage that comes along with it, <laughs> right? And all the things that we have to think about and all the expectations that we have. And so the, the, the style of the play, I think, is rooted in that need to try and be as truthful as I can be with the emotional uh, journey of the time, but then also giving myself some freedom to play with it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yes, well, thank you. It was a very emotional time. I didn't really think about, you know, how, how excited I was about the, uh, the test itself. And then comes Ira and combine all this. It was really just extraordinarily emotional. And, and uh, it was another world, um, another world that was mm -hmm. just in another place, I guess. Um, and it's what it took to make it happen, I suppose. Uh, there's a question here from JB, Janie's husband, um, who says, uh, I, being a Canadian by birth, am actually surprised that your product chose Canada to test market it in. <laughs> <laughs> Subtle as they may be, there are cultural differences between the two countries. It's changed now, but was there any other particular, any particular reason that Canada was chosen I think the company, um, the company did not really want to do this test <clears throat> under their own auspices. Mm -hmm. So they chose another, they made another company out of the company to do this in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it also allowed them to do some market research to decide whether it was a, a viable product, you mm -hmm. know, in another place. And, um, and so that's the whole reason for that. And of course, at the end of that, they decided they couldn't really put this in the market. They'd have to get sales and all, all, across the country and, and start mm -hmm. a whole new part of their business. And so by licensing it to other existing companies, they didn't have to do it. And they just stole the money from licensing. That's that was right. Like Did yeah. you um, test it in French Canada as well? Yes, yes. Well, all the packages, these tiny little packages had to be done in both languages and uh -huh. the whole, <laughs> you know, the instructions and everything. The, the ads in French and, and English and um, yeah. Um, we, we, were, we were asked by the company on a Thursday night, tell them they told, they told us we were going to be going to Canada for a test market, and they wanted to have all of Canada marketing on their desk uh, Monday morning, so we spent a pretty heavy going weekend getting to learn, you know, learn about Canada. It was really um, <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. Um. Great. There's a there's a, a question here about um, mentioning the idea of you fighting for women's access to testing in order to have autonomy over their bodies. And there's a question about reflecting or speaking to the current struggle for everyone to have autonomy via testing for the COVID virus. Right. Yeah. 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 I think we're still in a in a a, a, a space of huge uncertainty about this and just the avail there's there's um there's also a scene in the play where there's a young woman who comes in and she's uh, struggling with the availability of it and the test not being available in the united states it's being tested in canada but it's not here and when can i get it and and all of that and it, there's just the answer at the time was i don't know i don't know i don't know and we're very much there right now. And mm -hmm. it's um, what, what's interesting to me is I actually, um, to prepare for this, I you know, actually you know, scanned through the, the play earlier today. And that scene kind of hit me in a different place 
mm. than mm. it had yeah. before. Yeah. I think that's kind of connected to to where we are right now that we're in a different different space I think culturally as well as just socially and you know I'm looking at Meg and it's like I want to hug you <laughs> a lot of miles away. no we're all so grateful thank away. you I know I know so I'm you know I'm thoroughly enjoying this at the same time you know there's there's community here most certainly but we're also just uh uh unfortunately forced to create space in the places in our lives where we don't want to do that. And that's in storytelling. I mean, everything I do as a, as a writer and a teacher, especially is, is kind of up for grabs right now. And it's, it's weird. Yes. Um, I have two, just two more things to bring in and then we're going to wrap up and we're going to bring everyone else back in. But um, we have a question from Lori uh, Walter Hudson, who says, Meg, you mentioned that you just knew you had to do it. Did it feel like your life changed in this moment? How did that work with the 10 year gap from creation to market? And did you ever expect or yearn to become a household name? I didn't expect to be a household name. I, um, I, I knew it had to happen. And of course, for a period of time, the company didn't do it because they had to stop while they were getting licensing for their professional pregnancy test. So there was a gap of time. And I thought it might never happen at all. And at this point, R and R are together and we start our business and we're working together. And that was a surprise when they came to us on that Thursday to say we're going to do a test market. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I thought it, it, I thought it was just going to go away, and I didn't know what to do because I couldn't actually make this myself. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Um, I have a final question, which is just, um, and maybe either of you could, both of you could answer this from your own perspective, but just advice to the playwright who's telling the story of this moment 40 years from now. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. How I many years from now? <laughs> 40. 40. Oh. What does that mean? Yeah. Wow. There's a, to, to kind of go back to the, uh, to kind of go back to the question earlier, I mean, there, there are these, these profound things that happen to us and when we're in the middle of it it's it's so difficult to kind of look at the scope of what's happening and we're in we're embedded in one of those moments right now and I, I think that for if I were to be writing a story set in this era but move it you know 40 years into the future I, I think it becomes to me about this yearning, this deep-seated yearning that I'm getting from everyone, from my friends and my family to just connect. You know, Ian Forster, beginning of Howard's End says only connect. I mean, that's what it is. It's and, and human beings connect. And I think that when we're put into a situation where we can't do that, that sort of forces us to make different choices or change or adjust or adapt. And I think this moment right now that we're having this sort of Brady Bunch sort of, <laughs> you know, everybody in, in video, but still talking is, is indicative of that need and that desire. So I'll be very curious to know what storytellers 40 years from now is sort of what, what moments in the history of this event they look at as significant. Um, and it could be something as simple as, you know, people doing a video chat, like what we're doing now, mm -hmm. or something as important as, you know, what's going to happen in the upcoming election and how that's going to yeah. yeah. unfold, you know? So, so I think that what, while we're in it, it's very difficult to get perspective. Um, but I am an intensely optimistic person. And so my, my hope for the future and for storytellers of the future is that they see this as a turning point for us. And they see this as a moment where society decided what's important. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Meg. Anything from you? Yeah. I agree because I think um, everyone was sort of thinking about a little bit the way life goes and where, you know, where, life, where life is going. And it's, um, a, I think it's a very important time. It really is. And we don't know how long this is going to last, but it might be another month or two. But we'll come out of this with a different world. We really will. Very different. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank both of you so much for joining us. I'm going to invite the NNPN people 
back. I'm so <laughs> grateful. <laughs> Thank you. For this conversation and this forum and these amazing women and this amazing audience. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> This was great. This was exactly what I needed right now. I was having a really bad day before this. So. Excellent. Nan. We are so happy that we've been able to give you a lovely evening to go to finish your day with. What, what a wonderful conversation, ladies. Thank you so very much. Thanks to uh, Jen Blackmer and Meg Crane and Lisa Rothi for joining us. Um, what a reminder this has been that we're all struggling to control what's happening right now and that only by being mindful and uh, supporting each other can we support our own world. Um, impact resounds. Out of the box thinking changes the world. Stories matter and only individuals can make a difference. A special thank you to our NNPN ambassadors, Jane and J.B. Harrison, Richard Winkler and Carol Dweck and David Goldman for their continued long-term support to the NNPN member theaters, affiliated artists and ambassadors across the country who've helped make this possible uh, and for this great turnout. And a special thank you to the staff of NNPN for making tonight such a success. Um, Jess and Jordana, if you guys want to come back on. For those of you who can't wait for this Rolling World premiere to come near you, to dig into Predictor, we invite you to head over to NNPN's New Play Exchange to download the script. That's at www.newplayexchange.org. New Play Exchange, or NPX as we call it, is the world's largest digital library of scripts by living writers with a reader subscription for only $10 for a whole year. You can download Jen's plays and many, many others of the more than 32,000 scripts that are currently found there. And PX is another of the transformative programs which an NPN is very proud. If you need any help getting set up with a subscription or anything else about what you've heard tonight, you can email jess at nnpn.org. That's J-E-S-S -S at nnpn.org. And she'll be happy to assist you. Remember, you can support the network and the its work by donating now at nnpn.org. Just click on support at the top of the home page. Anyone who gives $25 or more will also receive a special gift from the network to help you enjoy new work now and for the coming year. And now, please join me, our host, our guest, and the board of National New Play Network as we toast the new works in the American theater that are coming your way. We look forward to sharing Predictor and many more new plays with you very soon. So, to the help of the network, the American theater, and to all who believe in the power of artists to survive, thrive, and share the stories of our time. Here, here. Here's, here, here. Here's. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Stay home. Stay well. Go to newplayexchange.org and read a new Read some plays. And yes. please continue to support NNPN by donating at nnpn.org. Thanks again, ladies. Thank you Thank all. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, Jess, Rosanna, Meg, Jen. Yay. Good Thanks night, everybody. Love. Night. Love you. Bye. I love you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.